Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to the Flower Lounge. On this episode, I chat with another hardcore nature lover. And before I introduce him, I just want to share a little bit about how I came to know about him. I fell in love with this company called Juniper Ridge several years ago, and I had just come back from a distillation trip of my own, the first and only, actually, creating essential oils and hydrosols of pinion pine. And so I knew how much work went into the process, and I fell in love with the whole idea of Juniper Ridge. I started burning their pinion pine incense every day and drinking their evergreen needle teas. And even though I work with flowers, I'm really a forest girl at heart. And so Juniper Ridge just brought me right back into the forest. They use techniques like distillation and tincturing and fusion on florage. And they also have something called the field lab, which is where they make small batch trail made fragrances produced in numbers, usually less than a hundred. They also make teas, soaps, incense, smudge sticks, and more. And I'm super excited because on today's episode, we have with us the founder of Juniper Ridge, Hall Newbegin, who crawls around in mountain meadows and hits the forest trails to gather and harvest wildflowers, plants, bark, moss, mushrooms, and tree trimmings to distill and create natural fragrances from creating and capturing the magic of special places around the United States. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Hall's background. He was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, and he grew up in the shadow of Mount Hood, spending weekends on the lakes and the forests of the Cascades, which instilled in him a lifelong love of nature. But it wouldn't be year, until years later that Hall truly understood its restorative power and the necessity of wild places to his personal well-being. He graduated from Vassar College with a BA in philosophy, and then he felt the call of the West Coast, and in particular, the deserts of the Mojave and the Southwest. He took to the alien landscape with gusto, served as a trip leader for the desert survivors from 1991 to 2005, and under the tutelage of Steve Tabor Hall, learned to see the apparently barren desert for the complex and diverse ecosystem that it was. You can't fully appreciate its arresting beauty in a glance. You have to dive deep into it, immerse yourself repeatedly before its many layers could be discovered. And I understand that because I live in the desert. So the idea of having to dig deep into a place furthered by the writings of a poet, um, Gary Snyder, who's a hero of Hall's, this cultivated the ground from which Juniper Ridge would grow. During this time, Hall also studied with Adam Seller at the Pacific School of Herbal Medicine and spent a year practicing small-scale organic farming and Zen meditation at Green Gulch Farm and spent the most incredibly beautiful and wet spring of 1998 in Bisbee, Arizona, learning from herbalist Michael Moore. So it was during these studies that the idea for Juniper Ridge took root and began to grow. If people couldn't get to the natural places Hall knew to be so intrinsic to our spiritual, mental, and physical health, how could he bring some part of nature home to them? And that is exactly what Hall is doing. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Hall. So excited. Thank you. That's such a flattering introduction. I'm so flattered. Wow. That's really <laughs> nice. You did all that research on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And before we begin, I was hoping we could do a little exercise. Okay. So you're going to have to stand in one mm -hmm. spot and close your okay. eyes and go back to a time in your childhood when you played around plants or trees or flowers. Oh, God. Okay, right. Sure. Yeah. And just think about what you were doing and who you were with. and Maybe what was your favorite flower, tree, or plant? And then in your mind, think of three words to describe the personality of whatever that favorite was. Mm. And then when you're ready, open your eyes. And okay, I, those, if you... those, I know where I am. I, I went right back to being, I don't know, five or six years old in the parks near Portland, Oregon. Okay. I have no idea where I'm exactly, but I'm in the Northwest, and <laughs> there's this little, um, there's this little old strips outside the parks where you've got the old trees and little creeks and things like that, and it seems like a huge wilderness to a little kid, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm right there. I'm just like imagining that, and three words. I think of rotting, <laughs> hummus, and wet. It's just, it's just wet, like the, there's just, just giant stumps where the old trees are cut down in Portland, in the Portland area to build the city itself, and you know, it's just, I just can see it all. I can just smell it all. It's so beautiful. 
I love those evocative, weird composting things. I can't say I can't come up with a single plant because I'm always thinking of things in terms of places. Mm-hmm. It's really more about the, um, it's about Douglas fir, of course, and Western red cedar, but it's also about just that, that damp forest floor. Like that's where it's at in terms of what smells, what's coloring the air. Okay. So what does rotting mean to you? Rot, oh God, rotting is so what does that beautiful. Ev- evoke? What does that evoke? I know it's grody, yeah. I know it's grody to most people, but it's so beautiful. It's like rotting to me is the most, one of those complex things we can experience. It's the forest floor hummus. It's the rotting material, biological material on the forest floor. And you've got microbes digesting that stuff. And it's just, it's composting, right? It's, it's like digestion. It's going, it's going deep. And when you put your nose in that kind of thing, it just, so many things happen to us. So many things happen. It has so much to give us is what I always tell people. Because, you know, when you put your nose in that stuff, it's not about you doing something good or doing something you ought to. It's about experiencing that beauty. And it's so beautiful. And it's just so rich. It's so vastly more rich than, say, taking a Douglas fir bough and mashing up and smelling it, which I love. I love doing that. But what I'm talking about is that, like, deep experience of being in that place in a deep way. Okay, so what we find is that when you, the way you describe that childhood... Mm-hmm. whatever that sensation is, that would describe the way that you bring your gift to the world. So you could describe, we could describe you as complex, deep, and rich, creating an experience for people that brings them to that particular <laughs> place. <laughs> that fits right, pretty sure. well, right? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, that, that is what I do. That's what I've done with my life is bring those places to people. And it's always about the place, not about the plants. That's really true what you said, because I'm not interested in individual plants so much as I am in that rich place. And that's why the forest floor and the dirt comes into prominence for me is because it's just so what's in the air, right? You don't smell Douglas fir when you're out walking. It's a background smell for sure, but it's not the primary like conifer, like top note thing is not what's happening in the air. Right. In the Northwest, it's more about that like rotting thing. And it's so beautiful that way. I, my favorite hikes in the Northwest are always in the winter time, in the rain, in those lower elevation places where you can get deep, deep into that world. And it's so it's deep like, and beautiful. It's like alchemy in action, right? It's like transformation happening. It is, yes. It's, uh, I just am reading this book about ecstasis, about the experience of a transcendence. And, and yeah, it's something like that. You're right. It's beautiful. It takes your mind someplace that nothing else ever could. And it's so beautiful that way. Like It has so much to, to give us and teach us and just open up our hearts. It's so beautiful. Like that, That's just a deep interaction with nature. What we're doing when we do that is we're exercising, of course, a deep animal thing inside of us mm-hmm. we're all made to smell the earth and smell natural complexity it's what we did till 10 seconds ago in our evolutionary history we're animals right this part of right. our face that's what this part of our face does it interacts <laughs> with nature in place in a deep way and it's so oh god it's so fucking beautiful i can't even um i don't think anyone will ever understand why that's beautiful or what it's doing to our brains but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's complex and beautiful and you know, when, when the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, this is what we had, right? We're mammals skirting around the forest floor. This is what we had long before we had our language and our frontal lobe tricks and all the things that we do today. We had this. This is what we have. And so it bypasses all that. We don't even know why we feel better when we go for a hike after work rather than going to the gym. We have no idea why, but everyone feels that buzz. Everyone does. Right. It's fucking beautiful. It can take us someplace that nothing else can. And that's what I've always been going for with Juniper Bridge is to put that I mean I didn't realize it at the time when I was doing it but in my 20s when I was out wandering around the mountains I was depressed just because of like my my family and the way I grew up I just was depressed I didn't know why yeah I didn't know what's yeah. happening but yeah. I did know that if I was out there in the Sierra Nevada meadow in June and July and putting my nose in that dirt and the bees buzzing around my head and stuff like I just it just brought me someplace that nothing else can right and it's so beautiful it's just so beautiful that when I think about that time it just kind of makes me sad because I don't know, it's just, it's so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. So from the very beginning of Juniper Bridge, it's always about taking that experience, making it real and putting even a slice of it in the bottle. You know, like I'd be a big fat liar if I pretend like we got all of that. We don't. I can't possibly capture all those things that are happening out Sierra Nevada Meadow. Can't possibly do that. There's a million things happening, but I can capture a slice of it, a little bit of the magic. And when I do that correctly, it's so, it's so moving and beautiful. So there's nothing more beautiful in the world to me, really. Wow. That's about, yeah. It's almost, it's almost like, I always think of nature as like bringing you back to yourself in a sense. So oh, in a, yeah. it, like you're giving people a slice of a place, but you're also like bringing them back to themselves, right? 
That's right. It's, it's, it's a deep part of yourself, right? Like when you exercise this part of your brain and we're all made to do this, I'm not special. I don't have like an unbelievable nose or anything. Like I exercise all the time though. I, right. you know, it works well that way, but I have a normal nose. I have a totally normal nose. This is just human heritage stuff. This is animal heritage stuff. This mm-hmm. comes from those little animals that are scurrying around the forest floor after the dinosaurs died out. This is the same, same thing. It's the same thing. So when we're exercising that part of ourselves, we're exercising something deep in us and God knows where to lead. You know, it led me down my freak path. <laughs> it, led me to do what I, what I, it led me to do what I do. And what I'm doing is so unusual and out there. It's, I mean, I didn't do it for a fucking business or making money or anything. Like I did this right. because it's the most beautiful thing in the world. And to me, it was like the thing that saved my ass when I was younger. So right. I felt, I just couldn't imagine anything more beautiful. That's all it was. And I want I'm- to share that with the world. On that note, I read in an interview somewhere that you you were quoted as saying, plants took me by the collar and just shook me. And I was wondering if you could share, you know, what does that mean to you? Like, what was that experience? Sure. So that was that was when I moved back to the, to the West Coast after college. And when I was growing up in the Northwest, it was a normal thing. My parents are conservative Republicans in the Northwest, and they took their kids out camping and stuff and managed to raise four raving liberal hippies. But um <laughs> by, mostly by introducing us to nature that's really what it was but I mean, all of us are involved in nature in one way or another now so it, you know it's just like I don't know like I didn't I didn't understand it was anything special or anything like it was just sort of what was around me when I was growing up is green and all around me in the northwest and I wanted to get away from it I wanted badly to get away and just get into music and culture and the and the world of human mm-hmm. endeavors like that's what I fucking wanted so I went to New York for school and mm-hmm. got deep in the world of punk rock and music and just the whole culture thing like I was studying philosophy at Vassar College and I just got into culture in a deep way art film and the whole thing and I really love that world and when I was at the end of that time I was so hungry I was just so hungry to get back to it all like I couldn't imagine anything more rich or beautiful than digging in to that world of of nature of getting into place mm-hmm. and so when I got back to the west coast I moved there with a band I was playing in at the time and we all moved there and God, I just couldn't get enough of it. I just could not stay yeah. away from it. I just, it was so hungry for it. Like I was yeah. reading about it constantly. Gary Snyder, Wall Stegner, all those folks who were into place. Mm-hmm. You know, Wendell Berry, all of them. Just like, I just was so into that world. And it grabbed me and shook me. And, and I always describe it as love because you never know what love is. Like, no one understands what love is, but, or why we fall in love with someone, why we react to someone. But we do, and it grabs us by the collar and shakes us, and we right. can't fucking help it. And that's the most right. beautiful thing. It's the most beautiful feeling I know. When I'm when I'm grabbed and like I love something deep in that way, mm-hmm. it's the most beautiful thing I know. Wow. So that's what I mean when I say that. It's just it's the same yeah. experience as love. I think people can relate with that. Yeah, totally. And, and that passion just grabbed me and shook me by the shirt. It did. And I couldn't pay attention to anything else. I couldn't do anything else. I felt helpless in front of it. Just helpless. Wow. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And how did your, I see that you studied herbalism. How did your mm-hmm. botanical interests, I mean, you've always had a love for nature, but how did you shift out of medicinal herbs and really more into aromatic plants? Okay, so when I moved back to the West Coast with my bandmates and stuff in 91, mm-hmm. I, I was into this world of being out in the mountains. That was my thing. But I was also temping jobs in San Francisco, like working temp jobs and mm-hmm. doing like silly work around San Francisco, painting houses and stuff. And I just kind of want to make my life the same as what I was doing. So I was like, well, maybe I could be an herbalist. Maybe I could be a farmer. So I lived at Green Gulch Farm in Marin County for about a year and did farming there. And then I moved out to Bisbee, Arizona, where I studied with Michael Moore after studying with Adam Seller for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I just was like hungry for anybody who could teach me about plants. And mm-hmm. I feel like I got a second education in the Bay Area that was equivalent to my first education at Vassar. It was free. It was offered up by the hippies. It was just hippie schools. You know, it was just like <laughs> Harry Brownstein and different mushroom harvesters would take me out and just like show me the mushrooms and Steve Tabor and backpackers would show me the plants in the Mojave Desert. And it was just different folks, like the little ladies from the Native Plant Society who take me out and teach me about the pl- plants. And they still know those plants to this day better than I do. Mm-hmm. Like I just, I had such good teachers. I'm kind of embarrassed when I teach people these days because I don't feel like I'm a fraction as good of a teacher as they were to me. But someone's got to teach these people about nature and interacting with it in a deep way. Right. So I, do it all the time I do it all the time. But anyways, those are my teachers. And that's, um, mm. that's sort of where I came from. Like that's, um, and transitioning from being an herbalist into Tuna Bridge was just a matter of figuring out what I really love. Because mm. I realized that my passion about herbalism wasn't about evaluating patients or looking at people's bunions or talking about their 
ailments. <laughs> it was being out in the fucking mountains. That's what I loved. Yeah. Like the, the sensation of taking a, a trowel and digging into a lamation root in the mountains of Western Texas there. Yeah. And having that smell explode to the air was just like, oh my God. Like what the mm. fuck is happening here? It was so, it was just so beautiful. I couldn't imagine anything more beautiful. Wow. And that's what, that's what's grabbing me. So when I really looked at myself and looked at what's happening in my life, I was like, oh my God, this is what it's about. It's about this experience of smelling the plants and being the place. Okay. But you know, a lot of people have things that they fall in love with, right? A lot of huh? people have huh? passions, but like, you know, someone might ask you, yeah, but like, how did you have the balls to, to follow <laughs> that? Right. To follow I that. Wish I, I wish I'd known what I know now because I might not have done it. <laughs> it, was, it, was so, it was such an insane idea. It was so far out there at the time in 1990, what, seven, when I took my, you know, 1998, really, when I took my booth out to the Berkeley Farmer's Market and set up shop there and just started selling stuff yeah. that I harvested big through the week before. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. I sort of, I didn't have a business <laughs> plan. I didn't have like a startup plan or a launch plan or anything like that. I just, right. I just had this idea of making something beautiful and putting it in a bottle. Right. And giving it to people. And that's all it was from the very beginning. Right. And it just sort of grew on its own. I didn't have a strategy. I didn't know any of that business shit. Like, I didn't know anything. I got myself in so much trouble because of that. I didn't know anything about margins or anything. I didn't <laughs> care. I was just trying to make something beautiful. So my balls were just just uh, coming from, <laughs> from, like, wanting that thing to be beautiful. It's all it was. Mm-hmm. It's so simple. Like, I'm embarrassed to say how simple it was because I really don't deserve much credit for it. Like, it just, it happened. It just unfolded. It just happened and it flowed from my passion. And my passion isn't even... It's something inside me. It's been there since I've born. So mm-hmm. what can I say about that? I'm just an animal just following this path in life and doing something I love. That's all it is. Okay. <laughs> let me ask you something. I, I'm really curious because yep, sure. like, like I said before, I've only done one distillation because my focus is more on the energetics. Where, where'd you do your flowers. distillation? I did it in Santa Fe. Okay. And, with who? Uh, with this woman named Krista. Wow. Look she, at that. That's amazing. And she was doing, she was doing pine sedulous, the two needle pinion pine. Yes. Oh, I love that tree. Oh my God. It's my favorite. It's my absolute favorite. And okay. So here's what I noticed. And I wanted to know if you've ever experienced something Mm -hmm. similar. Okay. So, you know, we gathered all the material, we cut it into pieces. We had needles, we had the resin, we had all the parts and okay. So then we, you know, basically cooked it in this huge glass, it's huge round glass distillation equipment. And we waited all day. Okay, so It was all glass. Was, Was there copper there too, or was it only glass? All glass. So the distillation happened over the course of that day, right? And we just sort of like hung out in the area and we were, you know, doing things in the the place that the distillation was happening. Okay, but here's what I, here's what I experienced. I felt like as the, like, as the materials were like transforming or de- decomposing or, you know, changing form, Distilling, huh? yep. I felt yep. like the plant was doing something to us. Like, I felt like there was something inside me that was shifting and changing. Mm-hmm. Yep. And yep. I wondered if you felt the same thing before. Of course I have. That, that's where it all comes from. Like, that's what I'm saying about putting my nose in the dirt and loving the place <laughs> is exactly that sensation you had. Because nature is always working on us, right? It's like the old Wall Stegner thing about while the settlers were clearing the land, the land was also working on them. Yeah. Nature is always working on us. It doesn't matter if we have our iPhone earbuds in or whatever, if we have like, right. ch- chatting with friends. Right. If we're out in it, in that place, and For smelling sure. and interacting with nature in any way, it's working on us. It's always working on us. Always. Always, yeah. And it just seemed like something about the process of the transformation of it, of the distillation of the juices that that it was like intensifying something in the people that were present. Of course. Yeah. Cause you're experiencing that plant in a deep way. Like you right. caught hints of it, right. Cutting out the plants and right. right. It, but you, also you got this intensity going right. and you're there deep with that plant. Right. And I don't think that's about the plant. Like so much. I mean, that plant has been around for instance, for 180 million years. Like that's right. a, that's one of the conifers that shows up on earth about, it probably shows up about hundred million years ago, like that particular species. Yep. And, or no, I'm sorry, it's about 50 million years ago because that's when Pangaea breaks up. So that's when it was. But anyways, it's a long time ago. We show up 10 seconds ago. We show up 250,000 years ago. Right. That plant doesn't know us. Doesn't, I don't think it cares about us. But we grew up with it, right? We evolved with it. Since we're little critters on the Force 4, we evolved with it. So it does something deep to us. And I think that's what it's about. I think there's magic in there about that. I mean, I just, I'm not, I'm not one of those people who thinks that the plants are directly speaking to us. Mm-hmm. I love those plants so deeply. But I just, when I look at the natural history and the evidence, I'm like, huh. It doesn't really add up to make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. So I immediately started thinking about how our interaction with it is this deep thing inside of us. Mm-hmm. And of course we love those plants deeply. Of course we can't help ourselves because we evolved them, right? Like it's who right. we are. 
And what are some of your favorite plants that you've had just? Oh God, I, I love, so. like when I think of the Big Sur area, I think of hummingbird sage and black sage and woolly blue curls and those beautiful, beautiful sticky coastal plants. I really love those plants. I just love them. I find that as you go further south, and it's been observed by many natural history type folks, but as you go further south, the plants are making more interesting resins as they get exposed to sunlight. Their survival mm -hmm. strategies basically change and they start making more goo on their leaves because they're trying to get by. Like mm -hmm. when you're in the Northwest or South Alaska, it's beautiful, it's all green, mm -hmm. but there are less plants and there's less aromatic diversity happening. Mm -hmm. By the time you get into the Mojave Desert, where they're averaging two inches of rain a year, and the plants have adopted seriously strange strategies, <laughs> oh my God, like the smells just get, like they change from plant to plant and place to place dramatically. And it just gets overwhelming. It's like, I could make a thousand perfumes in the Mojave Desert of different places, just thousands. Wow. wow. So many. And have you ever thought of the sense as music? <laughs> I've lived my whole life through music and I just, I'm such a music nerd. I love music so deeply. Can we play a I fun game? Even... Sure. Please. Okay. So like if Big Sur, like all, some of the scents from Big Sur were mm -hmm. music, how would that be different from like the Redwood Forest or the Mojave Desert? Oh God. Have? Well, I, I think of the Mojave Desert as being psychedelic. I immediately think of the 13th floor elevators and deeply Easter everywhere is the perfect record to listen to in the Mojave because it's so deeply psychedelic and damaged and dark and fucked up. Whereas in the Redwood Forest, mm -hmm. you got more of this kind of dark, soothing thing. The Redwoods have a natural dark energy. They just do. So when I think of brighter places, I think of like Mount Hood and the Cascades and mm -hmm. being out in the open country up there. So that, that tends to yield more kind of light, um, sunny pop music to me. But I don't know. I mean, I, I, just, I think about sense music all the time, so I don't even know how to answer that or talk about it. I'm embarrassed, but I'd love to just, like, just talk about that the whole podcast. So. We can. <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> That's dangerous. Oh, my God, yeah. No, I think of, like, dark, damaged, psychedelic music, like Gary Higgins, that guy that recorded one record back in 1970s. It's called Red Hash, and he was busted for Red Hash, like, a week later and sent to jail for 10 years or something. But the record's just gorgeous. It's fucking gorgeous. And I immediately think of that as Redwood Country somehow because it's dark mm -hmm. and deep and mm -hmm. a little bit damaged. Whereas the Mojave Desert has this like psychedelic thing happening where it's more free-flowing guitar. And I just immediately think of the 13th floor elevators and like 70s era Grateful okay. Dead and things like that. Like I think of that kind of stuff for what about Big Sur? Oh, I was just gonna say Linda Perhax is the central coastal area for me. That record parallelograms. Mm -hmm. Again, she made like, you know, she released that in 1970 and there's probably like a thousand copies in the whole world of that record. And it's so fucking deeply dead. She wanted to be Joni Mitchell, but she's way too high in acid to make it work. And she was a, <laughs> she was a synesthesia. She saw, she saw shapes in the sky and converted them into music in her head. And one day she was walking around and she saw these like parallelograms, these uh, geometric figures happening in the sky. Mm -hmm. And the song came to her parallelograms. And that became her one record. And it's, an, it's just a, it's a mind-blowing record. It's so beautiful. I just love it so much. So I always think of that record when I'm thinking of that central coastal area. Big Sur south of Topanga Canyon, basically. Mm -hmm. That deep wow. central coastal area. So I tend to think in psychedelic terms with nature I do in general. Uh -huh. Clearly. <laughs> because it's so, it is psychedelic. It's what it is. And by psychedelic, I just mean it's mind-expanding and right. takes places you wouldn't expect to go. That's all it means. It doesn't have to mean like, right. you know, crazy like party or something. It just means like taking you someplace you didn't expect to go. Right. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you too about, you know, how you were saying that you didn't expect, you didn't know to have a business plan. You didn't know where you were going mm -hmm. necessarily in the beginning. And I also read a quote in an article from you that said, it's not about getting bigger and bigger. For me, it's about getting smaller and more specific. And I wondered if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. Um, when I say that I want to get smaller, more specific, that's different than the business's goal of growing. Businesses always want to grow, right? They want to make more money. That's what they want. And we need to do that to be successful. We do. I know we do. But at the same time, I want to take that money and use it to do the, what I think is more the art project part of Juniper Ridge, which is getting more specific. Rather than like blasting out Cascade Forest, which is a general representation of the Northwest with conifers, that kind of thing. I want to like get that place, that day, that trail, get really specific and deep, which mm -hmm. means the dirt. It means everything in there. So mm -hmm. really my goal here, my end goal, my end game here, is to become that freak who drives around in the field lab van and collects the plants and dirt and makes weirdo formulations on the road. That's the most beautiful thing I can imagine. Mm -hmm. And frankly, we're kind of getting there. Like we're getting close to me being able to do that, which is so exciting. I can't believe it. It's so much fun. Yeah. How much time do you spend? Like, you know, you got to run your company, but then that's really what you want to be doing is doing the weirdo formulations. I have such a great crew, folks. I can, I can leave for, 
I can leave for weeks at a time. I can't. I, I have such a great crew of folks. Wow. I love them and believe in them. And they're running that business. Like nobody's business. And they're running the cash part, really. Like they're making the cash part happen, mm-hmm. which needs to happen. I mean, that's the part I didn't get when I started my business. I didn't know anything about business. I, I didn't, I wasn't a business major. I didn't know what I was fucking doing. I just like was trying to make something beautiful. And I thought right. if I made something beautiful, everything else would take care of itself. It turns out it's not true. You've got to pay attention to the basics. So mm-hmm. I'm always advising my friends who start businesses on the money aspects because I know they have the passion part down. Right. The people I know in this world, they always have the passion part. People do mm-hmm. things for love or money in this life. And everyone I know does it for love. Mm. and they fuck up on the money part so the, <laughs> the money part's important it is it's really important you got to pay attention to it but without the passion part you don't have anything you can't even start so for me like it was just um yeah I just I, I was messing up on money and messing up all over the place and I was gonna ask I was just curious like have you been have you been a bootstrapper this whole time or did you uh, did you take investment money or how did you how have you okay, like right, managed your growth I, I still own all of it I own the whole company and I have managed it myself I had some advantages in life I did because my family has money I brought from cousins and brothers and aunts and uncles and my parents and just everybody like I couldn't even go back to Portland for several years during Christmas time because I was like the black sheep of the family I was like this deadbeat they wanted to catch up with it was so horrible but now the things are working I'm starting to pay them back oh it's so beautiful it's really beautiful so it's very work but yes I, I I think I had advantages that other people didn't have I had a house in Berkeley that I ran up like a you know like a Las Vegas slot machine I just ran that thing up and I fucking hustled with credit cards and mm-hmm. even did made up names and shit. Like I just did everything I could right. to get money. Every, everywhere I could ha- grab money I could, mm-hmm. I did. And frankly, the, the kind of company we're starting here, it's a heavy infrastructure company. Like every time we grow, we have to buy things like trucks and mm-hmm. distillation equipment. And we're the largest essential oil distillation facility in North America. Wow. It's sitting right here in Oakland, you know, that's it's sitting right wow. here. So. Wow. And that took a long time to get, it took a lot of money to get going and a long time. And so I invested, you know, quarter mil in that, that distillation facility alone. And we still only use that thing about maybe 10% of the time these days. Like we could use a lot more. Mm-hmm. So we're just now catching up with that investment, right? Because business is always about you invest money in the toys and you got to catch up with it. And that's what it's always about. Wow. Such a big machine. You, so how much material do you need to <laughs> yeah, collect? Yeah, three to 500 pots. Well, that's the thing about plants, right? You need a lot of plants to make a little bit of essential oil. Right. So you take redwood boughs. Right. You fill this up with 500, in 500-gallon 500 cans, and you've got maybe a beer bottle of essential oil per can coming out. So it takes a lot of plant material to make a little bit of oil, which is why the perfume world gave up on this stuff a long time ago right. and started using synthetics. Because, A, you can't, you can't control the quality. It's always going to change. Like if I harvest on a south-facing slope versus a north-facing slope for redwood, mm-hmm. I'm going to get totally different results. Right. Or spring versus fall, totally different results. Right. Or a different place. Oh, forget it. It's like it's crazy. So... <laughs> you know, it is, it, you just you can't control those. Like, all industry depends on McDonald'sization of things and making things the same. We embrace the weirdness of nature and the constant change because we're like, fuck it, we can't control this at all. So every single batch is going to be different. Mm-hmm. And we put the batch numbers right on the bottles and wear that proudly because there's no way of controlling what, um, what you're going to get. What are some of the flowers that you work with? Oh, flowers. I love flowers so much. Um, it's hard because I don't, there are most flowers I don't want to get into. Like, mm-hmm. I love hummingbird sage flowers more than anything in the world. And there isn't enough hummingbird sage in the world to make that a real fragrance, like something we do regularly yeah. without impacting the ecosystem. Yeah. So I'd never do it. I would never ever do it. Or Plagio both rise, popcorn flower in the desert. White flowers tend to be more aromatic than colored flowers because most insects are blind to white. So they're using the scent to attract the pollinators. And so those you know, both rides are just gorgeous. Those popcorn, one of my favorites. And they're abundant. Like you can do a lot with them. They're really abundant in, in certain years, just everywhere. Mm-hmm. So it's about finding things that you're going to order of magnitude deeper in the realm of sustainable harvesting because you're like, oh shit, if I harvest this plant, that plant's dead. So you better make sure you've got like thousands around you. You better make sure it's a really strong plant community and you're in the heart of the range. You're following Howie Brown's scenes rules for wild harvesting because mm-hmm. otherwise you're just fucking up the plant community and that would that could never ever even like do that so most of the things we work with are mm-hmm. conifers and large shrubs that respond well to pruning mm-hmm. because it's an easy way to keep up sustainability right. right right but as i get more into the art project aspect the um small scale harvesting of course i'm looking at those of course i am and i love flowers so much like i love I don't know, I think of, you know, California poppies, an obvious one. That is such a yummy, like, deep sub-opiate smell. 
it's so delicious. Mm-hmm. Like it's just so it's kind of musky and gross and weird and beautiful <laughs> all at the same time. And I always go for those weirdo things. It's terrible because like most people are like, you know, we've had fragrances return us like where people are like it's disgusting. I don't get it. Like for creosote, say in the Mojave. Ooh, people don't like that one. Oh, I love it. But, but that's how the that's how the tree. desert oh smells god. after it rains. Exactly after it smells like that you get. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, of course, you live in Phoenix, right? No, people got it are crazy about. It. They they demand it in everything. They want soap that way. They want everything that way. It's kind of grody to some people, and I'm always picking these weirdo things that are not good for my business at all, but they're working <laughs> for me. I mean, there ain't nothing like that place after it rains. And for the ten people's mind of blue, it's totally worth it to me. So that's mm-hmm. what Field Labs about is those smaller scale runs of things that just turn me on but wouldn't turn anyone else on <laughs> and maybe there are 10 people out there who appreciate them but those 10 people oh my god they're fucking crazy about it they're, they're, they're by far my biggest fans like they're the craziest ones like they really get into those fragrances and wow. they go deep with them and of course they do because what else could be more beautiful if you grew up in Ridgecrest you're gonna want that smell around you all the time I have a friend who grew up in Ridgecrest and lives in New York now he grew up with like conservative parents and he's like this liberal hippie freak and he lives in New York, but he wants that smell around him all the time. Of course he does. Right. Would too, you know, I would too. Right. It's a deep thing. It's deep inside of us. And what's it like to travel with you? You know, like what are the, you, you, <laughs> if you go out camping and you're sitting around the campfire, how many people do you bring with you? Like, what's it like? Well, it depends on what kind of trip we're on. If we're doing harvesting, like if we're doing a big trip, which we're doing right now down at a ranch in the Western Mojave. So that trip's all about getting juniper and some different Western Mojave species. And that's a big harvesting trip. Those guys are working hard. I'm not there right now, as, you, as you'll notice. I'm walking around the streets of Oakland right now. <laughs> so that's hard fucking work. I've been on plenty of those trips and done plenty of those jobs. Mm-hmm. And it's hard work. It's repetitive and hard. And you're just harvesting tree boughs all day long mm-hmm. and carrying them back to the truck, basically, until mm-hmm. it's full. Mm-hmm. Two trucks full. Two trucks full. It's a lot of material. Mm-hmm. That's all for our Mojave and coming desert cedar fragrance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's, um, that's one example of a kind of trip. Another, another example would be a field lab style trip, which I'm always leading, which will go up to the mountains, out to a place. I'm going down to Big Sur this weekend. And I'm just thinking about the things that are there right, right in front of my nose. You know, that mm-hmm. place, that day, that trail, that's what I'm going for a field lab. And this weekend in Big Sur, I'm going to be thinking about what Big Sur is like in the wintertime, right? I mean, mm-hmm. the plants have died back, the sticky gooeys, mm-hmm. they're not in the mix right now. They're not there. Mm-hmm. They're done. Mm-hmm. So what's happening now? What's happening in the air? I'm so excited to get down there and just explore. I'm always surprised. I always have a cocky sort of list in my head of things I think will be there, <laughs> things I think I'll be working with. And I'm always amazed at how wrong I am. I'm just so wrong. Like, there's always more to discover in nature, right? Like, I mean, I probably know more about the subject than anyone in the world. And I don't know shit. I don't know anything. Like, I feel like I'm just, I feel like on the first, like, couple pages of a giant, the best book ever is what I feel like. Like, the first chapter of the best book ever first couple pages that's all I am you know I had had a teacher who who said once that if you feel small like when you're in nature you feel really tiny and the tinier the the tinier and the more insignificant that you feel you become it's like you become the world and you become you become the that's John Muir thing about the church about nature being the church right you lose yourself in the bigness of it right when our Mm -hmm. little egos our yapping fucking egos are reduced to this like nothingness out there (laughs) like oh my god this thing's so much bigger than us and it goes on forever when we're around for 10 seconds. It's the best feeling in the world. It's such a relief to know that we're just these little monkeys hop around, <laughs> they're doing our best. And we're around for 10 seconds and gone, and it doesn't know about us or care about us. It's just sort of there, and it'll be there long after we're gone. And it's sort of beautiful, it's sort of beautiful that way. It really is, yeah. yeah. I I'm, so, if... I'm so on board for it. Sorry. You're what? You're what? Well, I'm just so on board for what your teacher said. It's amazing mm. with what that person said. Yeah, and I wondered if if you could, so like for the listeners, if you could give some advice, because I think, you know, a lot of us are spending a ton of time on computers and just to be out in nature is a, is a challenge. Sure, right. right. And so if you were going to give somebody advice for how to dive deep into place, like like how okay, do you sure. get into the dirt and, and smell? You're probably not able to get out there in a deep way because you don't know how to go to a wilderness area, go backpacking. That's all fine. You can do this in parks. Like when you're using this part of your face, your nose, your, your sense of taste. You're using your primitive animal senses. The more you use this, the more you're going to get So you can do that when you're eating food. Like people do it all the time with wine, right? They're always using their nose for wine. Why not use it for beer, for your food? Just smell deep when you're cooking food and it'll help you get there. It is such deep evocative moments. Cooking is a great example of how you can get there. Or walking down the street in New York. Like when I was back in New York for our pop-up shop that we had in, oh, like five years ago at the fellow barber on North 8th, 
I was just blown away by the smells. I was like, holy shit. It had this deep psychological resonance thing with me, of course, because I went to Vassar College. But like the hot dog carts near the Met, oh my God, that's like so, <laughs> it's so beautiful. Like, and, and it's dumb because like, of hot dogs, who cares? But you're using that part of your face. And you're, when you're using this part of your face, you're using your animal senses and it has so much to give you. I'm just always like, I feel like a Johnny Appleseed of use this part of your face because it just has so much to give you. It's like, I have a racy mind, as you can tell, and I'm very adrenaline focused. And I like to, I love the pin, pinball machine effect in my mind. I really do. I love music. I love nerdy facts. I just like, this, my mind races around and grass <laughs> and loves that stuff. But And at yet. The, at and the yet, right? Time, <laughs> at the same time, I love when I get back in my body. I love it. So I've always been attracted to things like yoga and farming and, mm-hmm. and meditation. And using my nose gets me there quicker than anything. I know putting my nose in the dirt or rotting log will get me there quicker than anything I've ever imagined in terms of like putting myself in my body. So for me, that's like a meditational practice or a, a spiritual practice for life really is what it is. And I'm always going on talking about that. It's nothing to do with my company in some ways. I mean, I'm sometimes accused by my employees of not, you know, caring about Juniper Bridge because I go out and talk about this stuff like this is what I care about really this is what I'm passionate about right. is using your fucking nose I want people to use their noses right. and use them in that deep beautiful way because there's so much to give you that's all it is that's all it is it's not because it's good for you or anything else it's because there's so much to give you it's so deep it's right. so beautiful to give you well it brings you right into the present moment and the present mm-hmm. moment it's pretty big and vast and rich and that's right when you get in your body you're in the present moment which is infinite as we know <laughs> it goes on and on from all the spiritual teachers, we know that the infinite moments are where it's at. So if you can find a way to shortcut and get there, oh my God, it's a beautiful thing, right? Use your nose, use it. Use it for everything. Use it in cooking. Use it in walking on the streets. Use it to smell your lover. Use it everywhere you can, everywhere you can, because there's so much to give you, so much. Mm-hmm. It's so beautiful. And sitting right there. Like, this is not a very emphasized sense, right? Like, we don't talk about it much. Like, we use our eyes and ears and we absorb, absorb information. That's all frontal lobe stuff. That's fine. We all have well-developed frontal lobes. That's not our problem. Our problem is calming down, getting back into our bodies and finding that beautiful place. And that's, um, that's what I'm always trying to get people to do is that. <laughs> it's not you know. See, it just changed right there. It's beautiful. God. It just changed you immediately. It, nothing, nothing shifts my mind. And it's just me back into my body, like using my nose. Nothing. Mm. Wow. So the heat coming off the pavement and... There's some tar down the street. Someone's doing some like road work or something. I smell that too. And it's kind of phenomenal what it's doing to me. It's like silly stuff, right? It's just like fucking petroleum tar and hot pavement. And, and it smells good. It's doing something to me incredible. It's doing something amazing to me. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. So is there anything that you want to share? Any upcoming projects or anything coming up that you'd really love to share with people? Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing some new things. Like we're making body oils. We're doing all sorts of new things all the time. But mm-hmm. it's not as interesting to me as talking about that beauty. It's just not as interesting. But yeah, yeah, we've got some things coming out. You can follow us on Juniper Bridge on Instagram or follow me, Crawl and Wet Dirt, online. Okay. On the- so, wait, let me wait, 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 let me say that slowly because I want to make sure people sure. people get that. If if oh, people sure. want to learn more about your company, Juniper Ridge, they sure. should go to juniperridge.com. Sure. And, and they you- can also follow us as Juniper Ridge on Instagram. Oh my god! And they have amazing photos. You guys have the best. Yeah, it's our, it's our main social networking voice for sure. That's that's our pal Nikai, and she's amazing. Yeah, she's incredible. And your personal Instagram account, in case people want to really follow oh, you sure. and your it's adventures. Crawl. It's crawl on wet dirt. Love it. All one word. And that's what I do with my life. It's what I do metaphorically. It's what I do for real. It's what I do. It's what I do. Okay. Last question. Yeah. Let's talk about crawling in wet dirt in your life. If we, if you could just share a little bit about, so I know literally you do crawl in wet dirt, but <laughs> can you also explain metaphorically, like internally in your life with whatever challenges or whatever life experiences you've sure. had, what, what does that mean to crawl sure. in wet I, dirt? I, I would be a big fat liar if I were to say that Juniper is easy. It wasn't. It was so hard. I made so many mistakes. And I always feel like I'm crawling in wet dirt in my life because I'm trying out different things. Like when I say crawl in wet dirt, I'm thinking about a particular day. I was hunting for Matsutake mushrooms on Mount Tamil Place where I live. Mm-hmm. And I just suddenly got this intuition about Matsutake's being in this one spot underneath the tan oaks in the thick Manzanita thickets. I started going towards it and I was reduced to crawling quickly because I'm in Manzanita thickets. Nothing there, nothing there. And then I, find, I was about to give up. It started raining really hard. My jeans were getting all wet. I'm like, God damn it, I've done it for myself again. I'm like, I'm here in the <laughs> middle of nowhere with the rain coming down. You know, I'm only like 20 minutes from Mill Valley or something, but. I'm still just kind of getting miserable. I'm getting miserably cold. So 
<laughs> I slow down. I'm like, okay, I can either go on, I can turn around and go home. And then I found it. I found the sweet, thick, young white matsutakis, just cinnamony and beautiful, just just delicious, just like so thick and so beautiful. And there were just tons of them. And I'm so excited. I was like, oh my God, look at this. It's so beautiful. So that's nature, like just, just gushing with something beautiful. It's coming out of the earth, right? And so that's what I think of when I think of calm wet dirt. So when I say metaphorically, I mean that in my life, I've always gotten the best things from, as Kyle from Little Wing says, knocking on every door, trying every way, trying every way, just like wandering, following my nose and wandering. It smells like Matsutakis. I'm going to go over here and crawl beneath Manzanitas. Mm -hmm. Doing shit like that just like gets me everything in life because it's the weirdo shit that you don't understand that leads you down the right paths to the good stuff. You'll fail like nine times out of ten. Nine times out of a hundred, you'll fail. But that one time it works, oh God. It's just so beautiful. And, and the beautiful is always there. So that's what I mean by crawling. I'm always checking out every corner and checking out things that people haven't thought of before and just trying out stuff. You're fearless. Comes from I'm not fearless at all. I'm so full of fear, but it's um, <laughs> it's just it's just, <laughs> it's just it's just how I find things, and I, I love it so much. It's beautiful. I'm hides. I'm afraid of all sorts of stuff. <laughs> but I mean, I think of, of fearless as like having fear and doing it anyway. Like you don't know your path, but you just forge ahead. I, you just I, get I love in there. The I do. I love getting in there. I do. I love it so much. That's what I do. Yeah. Wow. And you know what? You can really feel that in everything that you make from Juniper Ridge. So thank you so much for that. I really, really love your work. You really see it. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.